totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little hands says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll on! We are totally booked. Welcome back to the Booked on Rock podcast. Chris Sutton, he's making his second appearance on the podcast. Last time we had him on to talk about his book, Alice Cooper in the 1970s. And you can hear that interview in episode 13. This time, he's here to talk about his brand new book, Black Sabbath in the 1970s. The 1970s saw the rise of rock and metal as a force in record and ticket sales. Right there at the birth of this was Black Sabbath, whose first album came from nowhere to smash into the top of the charts in Britain and around the world. Black Sabbath in the 1970s covers the career of the original foursome, bassist and lyricist Geezer Butler, guitarist Tony Iommi, singer Ozzy Osbourne, and drummer Bill Ward. From Polka Tulk through Earth and their original nine years as Black Sabbath, when the band recorded such iconic albums as Paranoid, Sabbath Bloody Sabbath, and Masters of Reality. This book includes new interview material from key figures including Rick Wakeman and engineers Mike Butcher and Robin Black, among others. It's a comprehensive roundup of the band's music in that decade. All of the albums and singles, from The Rebel Until Never Say Die, are examined in detail, along with related archive releases. Also included is a section covering Black Sabbath's tours in the era, looking at key live recordings from every tour. Overall, this is the most comprehensive account of the fortunes in the band during this crucial decade yet written. Chris also gives us his theory behind the story of the song Black Sabbath and who that figure in black really is. He tells the story of the time Tony Iommi gave him a ride home. Chris Sutton has been a fan of Black Sabbath since the early 70s. He manages and has written several publications for Smethwick Heritage Center Museum. He's also written several plays. Black Sabbath in the 1970s is his second book on music for Sonic Bond Publishing, following on from Alice Cooper in the 1970s. Chris also writes for Powerplay Magazine and has contributed to a documentary on Alice Cooper. He joins us from his home in Great Malvern, UK. Hear a playlist of Black Sabbath, including the music discussed in this episode, on the show notes page. Chris, welcome back to the podcast. It's great to have you here. How are you? I'm doing fine, Eric. Thanks for having me. Um, I thought I'd better get another book out so that I could talk to you again. So here we are with Black Sabbath in the 1970s. Oof, always good to have you on in this one. This is going to be a good one. What rock and roll fan does not like Black Sabbath? It's interesting you say that because back when I was young, um, it was very hip. And I'm talking about the 70s, early 70s. It was very hip to like Led Zeppelin or Deep Purple or Pink Floyd or Yes. But if you said you were a huge fan of Black Sabbath, there was a kind of a split response on that when I was growing up. They were kind of like the um, the ugly younger siblings, if you like, of those OK hip bands to like. That's what I mm. found interesting. That's one thing that you remind the readers of in this book who may not have been around or too young to remember when Black Sabbath was around. During the early years, they didn't receive mm. the same acclaim and respect from the press as their peers. Now they're no. so respected. They're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So many bands and artists cite them as a major influence, and critics have come around to the band in retrospect. But that wasn't so in the beginning. Why do you think that was? I, I think, for, for start, I think they were a bit pigeonholed, certainly in Britain, as being... Um, because they were from Birmingham, not from London. It wasn't a hit place to be from. They were certainly patronised for their working class upbringing. Um, the Black Magic connections that were largely promoted by Vertigo Records, more in the UK than, than Warners did in, in America. Um, that certainly was a bit of a millstone around their necks. The interviews with them in the early 70s, because for this book, I decided to go back and look and see what they were saying in magazines and newspapers at the time and the interviews are fairly hopeless Eric you know there's not much of substance in them at all odd bits and pieces that you would get but the interest from the press just evaporates once they reach say 1972 and then you see Tony Iommi in particular trying to get the credibility for the band and you see that um I think with the Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath album, where it's got the look and the feel of, say, a Zeppelin or a purple cover, there's far more attention to detail paid on the cover. And the production has certainly gone up several notches by then um, from the early productions. Well, it did take a while to get the respect from the critics, but as far as the fans, Black Sabbath had a huge fan base that they built up even before that first album came out. And you write about this in the book. 
Black Sabbath, back when they were Earth, before that they were Black Sabbath, they gigged around the country solidly in Britain. Um, and this is something you could do in Britain. It's hard for us in Britain to appreciate the size of America. We know that. We know that Britain fits into each of almost every American state's. So our version of big is different to your version of big. But even so, they were gigging the length and breadth of Britain with um, strongholds in the Midlands, Birmingham in particular, and then up north in the Carlisle area. And they just gigged and gigged and gigged. And by the time that first album was released, there was a huge fan base ready to buy it. And when it leapt into the charts, it shocked everyone. It shocked the record company. It shocked the music press in Britain. Everyone was surprised. Who is this band Black Sabbath and where has this album come from? And the cover's mysterious. There's no pictures of the band on that cover either, not one. And you mentioned Birmingham. Let's go back to the beginning. All four of the band members are from Birmingham. Can you talk about their backgrounds, the working class industrial life they grew up in? Because this would heavily influence their sound. Ozzy worked at a slaughterhouse at one point, right? Yeah, he did. Um, Birmingham is um, a city of contrasts. Um, you've got the city centre and then you've got the the suburbs around the city centre, which are extremely working class. Um, and Aston, where they grew up, is a very working class area. People would have worked in factories, you know, that kind of industrial environment. Once you get outside of there, where, where I grew up, it was like villages and places that were assimilated into Birmingham. So your aspirations were to get out of, say, the districts of Aston and move into the leafy suburbs, if you can put that into any American sort of context. You aspire to have a bigger house and the car and and that kind of thing. Whereas where where they grew up in Aston, it was very kind of extremely working class. I've been around all their houses where they lived um, and stood outside the doors where they all grew up, except for um, Tony Iommi's, which was pulled down a long time ago. It is still a gritty area today. Bill Ward's house was what we would call a semi-detached house and is the nicest one of the houses that I, that I stood outside. Um, he lived a bit outside Aston, in fact, Bill did. Um, Giza Butler's house was a three-storey terraced house. Um, the band used to rehearse in Giza's parents' basement there. Ozzy's house, very small. You can now actually stop in Ozzy's house. You can go and stop in his bedroom, I believe. They open for tours? Like you pay... A fee to I get in? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I think it's a case of so many people have turned up, Eric, at the house. You're not going to miss a trick, maybe. You, you'll know about Ozzy's career as, as a burglar, his short lived career as a burglar. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, he actually burgled the shop that was behind the house that they lived in, pretty much. So, if you go out the back door of the house, there is like a yard, as we would call it, small square area, and there's a wall. You climb over that wall, you're now in the backyards of the houses behind you. And that's where the shops were. So Ozzy, in his infinite wisdom, burgled one of those shops and climbed back over the wall to his house. Wow. But he was doomed to failure from the start. Ozzy. So how and when does Black Sabbath form? Well, Black Sabbath as a band, they, they, they got together back in 1968, I think it actually was. They, they were the, um, the, the Polk Talk Blues Band. Um, originally, and they were either named after um, a brand of talcum powder used by Ozzy's mum or a local business, a local Asian business in the Aston area, or possibly a mix of the two. It was obviously a bad name. I can tell from your face it's a bad name. (laughs) And uh, Bill Ward came up with um, Earth. It was a shortened name, but eventually they became known as Earth, which is, is better. It's better, and they stayed known as Earth until um, 1969. Do they all know each other prior to the band forming? Do they grow up together, go to school together? Yeah, Ozzy always says that Ozzy was certainly at the same school as Tony Iommi uh, in Birchfield, and, and Tony used to beat him up, so he says, or was a person he was scared of because Tony was that little bit older. And Tony certainly um, was an intimidating fellow, apparently, it seems. He certainly could be handy when he was needed to be. But Ozzy himself could, um, was prone to using fists when he needed to as well. So it was the way they grew up. Um, it was an area where you, you, know, you had to be assertive and confident in yourself. Um, the, the two that I think, um, I mean, they're, they're four very different personalities, aren't they? You've got Bill Ward with his love of jazz drumming, and that's one of the interesting things about Sabbath in the Bill Ward era is how different the drumming is to any other era of Black Sabbath. Nobody plays drums like Bill Ward, 
Mike Butcher, who um, engineered and produced those classics in the mid 70s, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath and Sabotage, he thinks that the band was just, without Bill Ward, it just is not Black Sabbath. He, he absolutely, it's in the book, he actually said that to me, you know, um, take Bill away, there's no Black Sabbath for him. I know you probably get a lot of younger listeners who might not get this, but you know, we were there at the time when they started, and that's not decrying anyone who wasn't, but to us, Bill Ward was, you know, Aussie Tony Geezer Bill. That's Black Sabbath. That's how it is. The fact that Ozzy is where he is and Tony is where he is, to, to me, he's immaterial. It's those four people. Tony Iommi was, this is surprising, I didn't know this, read it in your book, Tony Iommi was actually a member of Jethro Tull, but not for long. But he says we can hear his riffs on the track Nothing Is Easy from Tull, which is one of my favorite Tull songs. It's surprising um, about that because if you listen to Stand Up, which is my personal favorite Jethro Tull album, always has been, and you said to me, there's a Tony Iommi riffs on there, then I'm going to start with A New Day Yesterday straight off the bat, because that sounds exactly like a Black Sabbath song of that era. But apparently, no, nothing is easy. He contributed some riffs to. Um, Ian Anderson's never denied that. Um, the obvious thing, I think, is would Ian Anderson have wanted Tony Iommi in the band with Iommi clearly able to write music, uh, a songwriter, if you like. Did, did he want another songwriter in the band? And you'd have to suspect that Ian Anderson wouldn't want another songwriter in the band because he never really has had one in the band apart from himself. So they're originally called Earth, but eventually it becomes Black Sabbath. This name comes from a time when they were writing some new music in 1969. This is when they come up with it. You even cite the night it became officially announced, August 26th, 1969. Can you tell the story behind the name Black Sabbath? There's, there are actually are several versions, but the one that seems most credible as to how they come up with the name Black Sabbath probably is when they're on a ferry traveling over to Europe and they're puzzling over changing the name because clearly the name Earth is only going to get you so far and you need something that's more um, attention-grabbing. And I think the best version is, is that Giza Butler came up with the name while they were travelling across on the ferry to Europe for yet more European gigs and suggested the name Black Sabbath based on the film that I think starred Boris Karloff, an old horror film, um, in Britain at that time, films would often be shown at cinemas years after they'd been initially released and would come round again. And, and that film had certainly been showing at the cinema around the time they were doing rehearsals in the Aston area. So I suspect that that is the truth of where the name came from. And then they'd effectively got this song, which at that point had no title, which was Black Sabbath itself. And of course, the, the title is not mentioned anywhere in the song. So you've got this uh, this great thing of them having their first album by Black Sabbath. The album's called Black Sabbath, and side one, track one, is Black Sabbath. Let's talk about that debut album. That's a classic, released on February 13th, 1970 in the UK. In the US, it's not released until June 1st of 70, which is interesting. Number eight in the UK, 23 in the US. Rob Halford of Judas Priest calls it the blueprint for metal. A couple interesting things you note that contribute to the Black Sabbath sound and that is Tony Iommi's use of a Laney amplifier and Geezer Butler mirroring Tony's guitar. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, the, the Black Sabbath sound on the first album is, is in development, it's fair to say. Um, one of the things I, I discovered fairly quickly doing the research for it was that there's a bit of a myth about it being, all being recorded in one day. It just simply was not all recorded in one day most of it is but two songs certainly are not two songs are definitely taken from a previous session but what you're actually hearing is in effect um, a black sabbath concert running through on the album if you listen and think about that you're actually listening to a, a performance if you like all the way through and the roots of what black sabbath became you've got the black sabbath track itself which features one of their greatest riffs um, that tony picks out but probably the one that shows the way forward most would be probably be NIB. That would be the first of the band's big big riff songs, if you like, with Tony cranking out the riff of that, that Laney amplifiers and, and Giesler doubling his riff and getting that terrific bass solo intro. But at the same time, you've got the likes of um, Sleeping Village, which has got that very acoustic kind of um, feel to it at the beginning, and that crops up throughout their work. Tony was always very big on the contrasts. He would always say, "You, if you have something quiet, then it makes the loud bits sound 
uh, more impressive. The, the dynamics were very important to Black Sabbath. They were certainly, I think, a probably more intelligent and thoughtful band than they've been given credit for, in my opinion. But it has to be said, they never saw their album covers. I think for years they didn't see their album covers until they were told, here's your album cover. And that's staggering for a band that we perceive as being such a big band. But uh, yeah, I, I think it is all there. If you were Rob Halford growing up then and you bought that Black Sabbath album, you felt like you got something very special, something um, very personal for yourself as a young man growing up in that time. And let's face it, most of the audience as they will tell you themselves, were mostly male. Um, they didn't really attract women, female fans, until much later on. That was a problem, if you like, for all of these bands, that they didn't really get the female audiences traditionally until they had, had those crossover hits. There is one story with Tony that's been told a lot, but it's still always great to tell again, an injury that he has to his hand that affects the sound of his playing. And this comes while he's working at a sheet metal factory. He thought his career as a musician was over, but instead he is inspired by a musician by the name of Django Reinhardt. Yeah, well, the interesting thing, it was actually his last day, allegedly, at the sheet metal factory, so he says, and the guy who was supposed to be cutting the metal was ill or not available, so Tony was given some training on how to do the job. That would have been probably about, knowing Birmingham at that time, that would have been about five, ten minutes of someone telling you what to do and, you know, be careful, Eric, when you put your hand in kind of thing. And he lost the tips of, um, of his fingers. And that instantly gave him a problem with fretting the notes. Obviously, if you've lost the tip of your fingers, it, it's going to hurt when you're fretting those notes. Um, and karmically, it is absolutely fascinating. I know somebody from his workplace came around, one of the managers, and said, hey, here, have a listen to this album. And he wasn't interested, as you wouldn't be when you think your career as a guitar player has just gone down the tubes. And then he plays you Django Reinhardt. And your first reaction is, well, this is a great album, but so what? Why am I listening to it? And then the guy tells you that I think Reinhardt only had two or three fingers left from an accident or burns. And so he'd had to get around that problem of how to fret and play, which Tony Iommi did. And I think it's incredible that by the time they get to the third album, we're probably going to come to that in a bit, but a master reality, what, what they invent and come up with it as a consequence of coping better with Tony's ongoing problems with his fingers is extraordinary. I mean, they, I think they invent, let's say it, I think they invent grunge, don't they? Oh, absolutely. And that's thanks to the drop tuning from Tony Iommi. Django Reinhardt, he was a jazz musician. And we mentioned Bill Ward being a jazz guy. He's interesting because he gives the heavy metal sound of Sabbath swing. I think with Bill Ward, um, he's very underrated by um, a lot of people because he doesn't do some of the obvious stuff. Um, and if you listen to the track Black Sabbath itself, I'm shortly going to be interviewing Bev Bevan for the next book that I'm doing, which is Black Sabbath in the 80s. And Bev Bevan, is, um, I've seen somewhere online, he talks about playing the song Black Sabbath, and he said, well, where's the counting for the drums? I said, there isn't one. And Eric Singer just said to him, you, you just you just got to watch Tony or, or Ozzy to work out what to do and where to do it. Um, Bill plays by feel on that track of where to insert the fills on the drums and, and how to actually just play it. It's, it's, it's not a technical piece. It's all about the feel. Um, he does it in um, War Pigs, that lovely swing waltz rhythm he plays on the intro of War Pigs. Um, the, the guy's just absolutely fantastic. I don't know what happens by the time they get to heaven and hell. One of the things I'd like to ask Bill is what happened to the drumming on heaven and hell, whether somebody told him to play differently because he doesn't sound as Bill-like by the time they turn into the 80s to me. More straight ahead rock? Yeah, it's one of the things I've got to kind of get to the bottom of when they get to heaven and hell, which is in the next book, is whose decision it was to simplify the sound, perhaps make it more direct. You mentioned Bev Bevan. He's uh, of ELO fame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he played with ELO and um, a band who were mostly big in Britain, I think, The Move. Um, yep. But he would have, it would have been a little bit alien probably for him. He would have just ex been expecting to play something perhaps a bit more obvious, but Black Sabbath songs are not as obvious as they seem to be. You quickly mentioned Eric Singer. You spoke with him. He's the drummer of Kiss. Alice Cooper's drummer, right? Is that the same Eric Singer we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. Eric Singer had played with Black Sabbath as well. I mean, you, you find um, it's... Um, 
like a treehouse gang, isn't it, of people who turn up on each other's records. And Black Sabbath in the 80s is a very different beast to Black Sabbath in the 1970s. I want to get your thoughts on Ozzy because there's so much talked about Ozzy, the character. He is a character, but as a singer, he's so unique. He's got such a great voice, and you team him up with Geezer Butler with his lyrics, and he's one of a kind. I think um, Ozzy Osbourne is very, very underrated as a singer, and he's gift with melodies. Um, I think we tend to see Ozzy as the lovable buffoon, the kind of the, um, the, the comedy figure who does these almost... I'm going to get shot for this. You know, these pantomime sort of performances he does now. That was a criticism when Sharon decided to put that TV show out in the early 2000s on MTV. Was that going to, as popular as it was, would that have affected his respect as a musician? I mean, for somebody like me and, and for you who are the diehard fans, I don't think it did. But yeah, I mean, I think it had an effect on his image. But he is legit as a singer, so distinct. And he wasn't somebody who was going to be paint by numbers. He's not going to study how to sing, do it by the book. Instead, he basically just says, turn the mic on, I'll sing, and whatever comes out, comes out. And that lends to his own individual sound. The, the guy who was most helpful on this book, and I'll give him a big shout out to me, was Mike Butcher, who engineered Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath and co-produced Sabotage. And he was so patient. I spoke to him so much because I keep thinking of things I wanted to ask him. And he said to me, he said, you know, Ozzy, he's such a gifted singer. Play something like Spiral Architect. You know, and the guy's gift of melody on Spiral Architect, how to handle it and the phrasing. He said he's first class, absolutely first class. That's not an idiot there. That's somebody who knows what they're doing. And um, all the way through, you can find examples of Ozzy's gift for melody. Um, he has a real flair for it. And the band has such a great synergy coming together Um Geezer writes most of the lyrics, as I'm sure you're probably aware. And there's a lovely story in the book, again, Spiral Architect, which is on the side of Bloody Sabbath, of them being at the studio recording it, not having any lyrics. Uh, and Ozzy having to go and phone Geezer, who's at home having a day off for some reason or other, and saying, here, Geezer, we need some lyrics for Spiral Architect, or whatever it was called, you know, this song. And Geezer, you know, harumphing a bit and thinking, oh, I'm having a day off, all right, give me an hour, an hour. Then Ozzy has to ring him back, and Geezer just reads out the lyrics over the phone to Spiral Architect, which are some of his best lyrics, I would say. Um, but yeah, a very thoughtful man, Geezer Butler. Yeah, and you think of just two minds thinking alike. His lyrics, Ozzy's voice, it's a perfect fit. One of the big Sabbath classics, which came back in the reunion era because they didn't touch it for many years, um, Into the Void, which a lot of your listeners will obviously know. Um, that's one that Ozzy used to dread doing and would have trouble with because what Giza was expecting of him with those lyrics is, is very hard to do indeed. It's a real stream of consciousness. He has to really push hard on that. And I think one of the other problems that Sabbath had a little bit was with their set list live. Um, by the time they reached Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, the band are playing sort of low, down-tuned, and Ozzy's getting higher and higher. By the time they reach um, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, Ozzy's voice is as high as it ever was which meant he couldn't do a lot of those songs on stage. Um, the fact that Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath is hardly ever played live by Black Sabbath is a tragedy, I think, amongst many. We're talking with Chris Sutton, author of the brand new book, Black Sabbath in the 1970s. You mentioned the title track to Black Sabbath. This was influenced by Geezer's riff, which was inspired by British composer Gustav Holst's piece titled Mars. He also writes the lyrics. So what's yeah. the story behind the lyrics to Black Sabbath? <laughs> Yeah, there's been a lot of versions of the story behind the lyrics to Black Sabbath. So you have to use, I think, a little bit of um, common sense about this. What would it have been? Um, the idea was, was that Giza had borrowed a book or been given a book by Ozzy and had been reading it. Um, something to do with black magic, the book was. And he's now trying to go to sleep and wakes up in the night to find a figure at the foot of his bed. Um, and he's terrified by this, as you would be and remembers what had happened and he actually the first verse what is this that stands before me bigger in black all of that was in in what happened to Giza when he was woken up in the night having looked at who was where and what was going on my strong view is that the figure in black was Ozzy Osbourne um I, I'm utterly convinced that he would have come into Giza's room and scared him 
but no one ever seems to mention that. But I just, I, I'm certain it must have been him. I've never heard Hopefully. that before. Yeah, that's a good point. Could very well be. Well, there's a lot of examples of Black Sabbath playing each other up and messing about as we go on. But that one appears to be a legitimate, um, some sort of black magic happening that happened that Giza talks about. Or, or alternatively, it's Ozzy messing him about in the night. And I think I'd like to go with Ozzy messing him around in the night, if possible. But they got a great song out of it. And, of course, um, they always talked about how the effects on the beginning were not there. Ozzy has said that he went around to his mom and dad's and played them the album. He was like, oh, gosh, what, what's all this, a rainstorm and a bell and everything? Um, but when you listen to the outtakes of the album, the bell was always there. The bell's on every take. So the only thing that they added, I think, was the rainstorm that were added after they'd gone home. And there's this intriguing thing, as you probably have seen in the book, about things being added to Black Sabbath albums after they'd gone home. Um, Mike Butcher, him again, he talks about the thing that he did on Sabotage that the band were not happy about at all. Um, the bit that he added on the end of Sabotage, you know, the blow on a jug piece. You, you turn the volume up and you hear that, and, you know, and he says they that they were displeased that he'd added it, but they, they got over it in the end. So they really didn't have complete creative control. You mentioned the album covers and things like that too. No, not at all. Um, I, I really don't think. I'm trying to think when they had first creative control. It would seem to be certainly by Sabbath, bloody Sabbath, um, that they they had degrees of creative control going on. Certainly the early albums they didn't. Paranoid is a classic example of things going badly wrong with an album cover, really. Um, so bad, it's brilliant. And then you get the album cover that I think is a bit unfairly derided, Sabotage, which I think is so bad, it actually is brilliant, that album cover. I mean, the one with Paranoid is just what a head scratcher, especially at the time that you're buying that album. You're looking at the title and you're looking at the photo and there is no connection whatsoever. Yeah, the idea was was that um, it was called War Pigs and the um, Keith, who did the, Macmillan, who did the cover, he'd also done the, the fabulous Black Sabbath first cover, which is eerie as hell. He then got the title for the second one, War Pigs, and other things were just time was running out, whatever. Okay, War Pigs. No, you've got nothing else, just the title. Okay. So we went and got some props and went out to um, the park at night where they shot that cover with his assistant. And his assistant's got a pig max mask and a kind of a, a vaguely sort of military look with a sword, a war pig, if you will. And his assistant has to run from behind the trees but because it's dark, he can't do that with a mask on because he needs to see what he's doing about falling over. So he does a few trial runs waving the sword. And then we go for the actual shot with the pig mask on, which means he might fall over because he can't see very well. But he manages that. By the time it actually gets to the record company, they're not happy about war pigs and the whole Vietnam connotations and, and whatever it is. And they're very happy about it being called Paranoid, probably because they've actually suggested there should be a single on the album. And that's a little bit mysterious how that turns up, to be honest. That looked a little fudge to me, the reasoning behind that turning up on the album, as I mentioned in the book. Um, but anyway, paranoid it became. And they also then changed the shots. Um, Keith McMillan has gone on record as saying they never used the final shot of his assistant in the pig mask. It's one of the trial runs that he did from behind the trees. So you've now got a, a man running from behind a tree waving a sword at you. Back to the original album, I want to mm. ask you about one other song, which I love, The Wizard, one of my favorite Sabbath songs. What's the story behind this one? Originally, it was titled Sign of the Sorcerer. Yeah, it was apparently entitled Sign of the Sorcerer. And this was somebody they saw moving around outside the studio, who they thought. Um, and and you've got these four guys who would take the mickey, as we call it in Britain. Well, I don't know what you would call it in America, but they would always be kind of poking fun at them, each other and at people. So if they saw somebody outside who was um, they could poke fun at, then they would. And they saw this this guy um, who they christened as the wizard, the sorcerer or the wizard. And the song uh, is actually written about him. I think the the triumph of the song on that though is it's again it's Bill Ward for me. Ozzy's harmonic a terrific intro, but Bill is absolutely phenomenal on that, doing stuff that you just I just wasn't hearing in other bands in that sort of genre. It, the, the, if you like the back of the denim jacket genre that we had, you know, over here, Bill was was different, more creative, I think, than a lot of drummers of that time were. 
The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. The Booked on Rock podcast is online at bookedonrock.com. Find a list of all the major platforms where you can listen and subscribe to the podcast. Link up to our social media sites. Find out the latest books on rock releases. Find your nearest bookstore. And if you want to reach out to us, you can contact us through our website, bookedonrock.com. You talked about the band members not being on the cover of that first album, but we do have a very creepy looking witch on the cover, which this cover is so iconic. This is my favorite Sabbath album cover. Keith McMillan, a.k.a. Yeah. Marcus Keefe. He's the artist who designed it. He called it a rundown, quite spooky place to take the photo. Yeah. Who's this woman chosen yeah. to be photographed? Because she talks about this the day of the shoot. She talked about it to Rolling Stone, which you include some quotes from. That's a really interesting story. Yeah, I, I tried to get hold of it to talk to her, um, um, but she's not easy to get hold of now. But she was just a model um, who had actually done the, the shoot. And they went there very early in the morning. I've been there myself. Um, a lot of Sabbath fans do go there. I've actually stood in exactly the same place that she's in on that picture. We all turn up and go there, and it still it baffles the the people who run the place to this day. All these people turning up and standing there. It's been used in a in a film or two as well, and it is as you say. It's it's one of the greatest examples for me of a cover that's working absolutely with what the band are trying to get across, the look, the feel, the image. It, it just ties in with the song Black Sabbath perfectly, absolutely perfectly. And you're right, it is the best cover. And it didn't take long for the press to latch onto those occult connotations in the band's name and the music and the album cover and all that stuff, so much so that Tony Iommi had to say something about it, basically had to address the public on this. He did it to New Musical Express, April 4th of 69. What did he have to say? He was very angry about it, Eric. He was um, fed up. He, he was saying that they were not a black magic band. It was not something that they were interested in, apart from warning people about the, the dangers of getting involved with black magic. There are actually only two songs on the first album that have anything to do with black magic, um, I would say. There's Black Sabbath itself, which is is a warning against the, the perils and dangers of black magic if you listen to it. Um it's certainly not promoting it by any stretch of the imagination. The one that's uh, NIB is is difficult because it's about the devil coming to birth in human form and um, and taking a woman as his partner. Um, so I suppose that's a bit tricky. But the real damage on the album is done by the story, the poem, if you like, on the inside that was written by um, Marcus um, Keefe's assistant, Keith McMillan's assistant. He actually wrote that poem that had nothing to do with Black Sabbath. They'd never read it at all until they got their copies of the album. So that was a, as much of a surprise to them as it was to us. The thing that I'm constantly surprised about is why they didn't use a promo picture of the band on the inside sleeve at all. I, I, I don't understand that whatsoever. My guess is that Vertigo just didn't expect the album maybe to do that well. It was available to them to release it. It had been recorded, it had been produced. They didn't have to do anything other than get a cover for it. So I think they were shocked when it was successful. And certainly Warners in America would have been shocked. You mentioned NIB, the song title. This has been a source of speculation. What, oh, yes. What does NIB mean? According to Geezer Butler, who should know because he wrote the lyrics, um, it stands for NIB as in a pen nib, as in when you write with ink. And he couldn't think of what to call the song. You'll notice NIB is not mentioned anywhere or nib anywhere in the song. Um, but he could have called it, um, he could have used some of the lyrics from the song clearly to have given it a title. But there was a thing about Bill Ward's beard at the time looking like a pen nib. We talked about them messing each other around a lot and Bill was always a figure of fun particularly to the other three, they would, they would tease him mercilessly. So they thought it'd be really funny to call the song after what they called Bill Ward's beard. But to make it interesting, they put some points between the N and the I and the I and the B and after the B, so it's N-I-B. But by the time Ronnie James Dio joins the band in uh, mid-79, and by the time they're touring in 1980, by the, I saw them at the Birmingham Odeon, and Dio goes on this long thing about it being Nativity in Black, which was mm. news to me. Okay. News to all of us. 
But apparently there are huge numbers of people who still think that the song is called Nativity in Black, which it isn't. Interesting. (laughs) Now let's get to Paranoid. Released in the UK on September 18th of 1970, in the US, released January 1st of 71. The album went to number one in the UK, 12 in the US. The lead track, War Pigs, a Black Sabbath classic. And this was inspired by an annual celebration called Walpurgis. And an yes. abbess named St. Walpurga. Am I pronouncing that correct? St. Walpurga? You're pronouncing it as well as I would, Eric. Lyrically, it changes <laughs> course over that. time, too. Can you talk about this? The thing I find very interesting about the song is that if you say, you said Walpurgis or Walpurgis, it, it, it sounds like Walpigs, doesn't it? The, the two words are so similar. Phonetically, phonetically, you're not far from saying the word war pigs, are you? Which, which I find interesting. The lyrics were originally very black magic oriented and, again, could be taken as a warning against black magic because they're not pretty images. Dead rats innards are mentioned and witches burning and so on and so forth. It's all grim stuff. What is quite intriguing is that those lyrics stayed to some extent in the set list until way after Paranoid was released. It's almost as though was he would get on stage and think, we're doing this song, what was it, Walpurgis, Walpurgis, Warpigs, whatever it is, and would have some sort of composite lyrics that he could do between the two, depending how he felt about it. All the way through the tour to promote Paranoid, there's scarcely a song that Ozzy does the same lyrics for from the Paranoid album, he's constantly changing and altering lyrics. And maybe he just couldn't remember them, or I I don't know what the reason was for that, or he decided to just jam them and change them, or something of that nature. But yeah, War Pigs is the the big classic song. Um, And it's formed, that and some of the other songs, has formed the bedrock, if you like, the building bricks that are in the Sabbath set list for many years, up into the reunions, you've got some of the big hitters from the Sabbath catalogue, you've got War Pigs, you've got Paranoid, you've got Iron Man, those three alone are, you know, are huge. And then there's other great songs. I mean, every every song on that album is terrific. Um, the one that I'm on a mission to promote to listeners, particularly though, is Planet Caravan, because it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's very jazz influenced. It's very different. And one of the big issues that Black Sabbath have on stage is they never really stray away from the the, the more heavy rock elements of the sound. They'd never have that moment really where they say, "Okay, guys, we're going to we're going to take it down a bit and do something a bit different and gentle. So the likes of Planet Caravan never get done on stage. Um, It's really down to like the intro to the song Black Sabbath for a bit of light relief on stage. And the other curse they've got live on stage, that really a 1970s curse, is, is the solos. You could have got easily another two or three songs on stage by Black Sabbath if they cut the solos down. And yeah, I know it was the era. I know that Jimmy Page was the worst offender with Led Zeppelin, but um, it, it is a shame, I think. Planet Caravan is very trippy, very psychedelic. We mentioned oh, Tall. God. There's flute on this track, too. It doesn't even sound like yeah. Ozzy. He's brilliant on this. They put an effect on his voice too. The Leslie Speaker, rotating Leslie Speaker effect they use on his voice gives it that kind of ethereal, otherworldly quality, which is what they were after. And it's it's hugely successful in that way. Um, they even managed to get a drum solo in effect on the album with Rat Salad, Bill Ward, um, which is a kind of a riposte to Led Zeppelin's Moby Dick, a more interesting drum solo, top and tailed with um, a guitar bass intro. And it's just, it's a really interesting album. I think I think the production's a little dry on the album for me. I think it could have done with a bit more, um, I don't know, a bit more wetness on it or something. It sounds a little dry to me at times, the album. But it is it did well for them. It got to number one, as you've said. It certainly put them well on the map. Do you know Rat Salad? Do you know the connection to Van Halen? I think they used to play it, didn't they? They may have, but that was what they wanted to call themselves at one point. Rat Salad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Imagine if Van Halen was Rat Salad. Here's Rat Salad yeah. with Jump. <laughs> Here's Rat Salad's yeah. number one single, Jump. Yeah, Rat Salad. Let's talk about the song Iron Man. The subject of the mm. song, it's so cool. It's very Twilight Zone-like. A time traveler who knows the future and what it holds for the world. He comes back to warn people of the consequences of their actions. What an intriguing plot. Again, this is Geezer, right? This is inspired by a book he read. 
Yeah, um, it, the intriguing lyrics, uh, um, with all due respect, are always going to be Geezer. I don't, they're never going to be Ozzy. And he, he does write some lyrics with Black Sabbath. Strangely, um, he actually wrote most of the lyrics of the song Black Sabbath itself. But as time goes on, um, in this era that we're talking about, it, it, it's generally all Geezer. There's a few cases where Ozzy's also written some lyrics, as, as we'll hear coming along a bit later. Yeah, Geezer's lyrics for Iron Man, uh, I, I think, are definitely inspired and taken from the book um, The Iron Man by Ted Hughes. That, I, that seems the most likely one, given Geezer's reading habits and what we know about him. I mean, there was speculation it had been taken from the um, the comic book character, The Iron Man, but I, I, I don't think that is likely at all. It was used, I think, in the end of the film, The Iron Man, wasn't it? Um, yeah, it was. Which was obvious. I, I personally spent the whole film waiting for that song to come on. I yeah, think it's on here. the end credit. Same here. Like, when is this going to come up? It, it's, <laughs> it's come yeah. on, guys. It's obvious you got to use it in there. Sure enough, they did. There was the <laughs> yeah. there was speculations, so we don't know for sure. It's it's likely that that's where Geezer got the lyrics from. But here's the funny one: I people would... people thought Ozzy was literally singing through a fan in the studio to come up with the effect that we hear when he sings "I Am Iron Man." That's not the case, though. How does Roger Bain and engineer Tom Allum come up with this effect? Or is it both of them or one of them? How do they come up with this? They use some sort of an effect on his voice, whether it's another Leslie Speaker cabinet or um, or some sort of synthesizer effect on his voice. But that they use that effect to get the metallic sound and his voice of the Iron Man. The bit, and this is a, a confession that I never realized for years, was that the opening sound is supposed to be the Iron Man's footsteps. Bill hitting the it's bass bomb. pedal is just oh. is to simulate footsteps. Yeah, I never got that at all until I started to hear bootlegs of Black Sabbath live. Then I got it. And Bill Ward would, if he was here, would tell you now that they they never got these drum sound right. Then, if you listen to any live version, it does actually sound like something heavy coming towards you, rather than just a very slow drum intro or something. Or for me personally, what I love is if anyone out there plays guitar or is thinking about playing guitar and you get tablature guitar tab you can have a ball with black sabbath to actually stand there with a guitar or sit there and play that riff to iron man which you'll get fairly quickly with respect to tony it just sounds terrific it just sounds biz- the business it really does there are those songs that transcend their genre and just puts them in an elite category people are, who aren't even rock fans or even know who black sabbath is know the song paranoid Interesting, though, this was a last-minute addition to the album, right? The story they perpetuate is, is that the Roger Bain, the producer, had said, we're, we're short, the album's too short, we need an extra track, and they went off to the pub and Tony came out with that riff while they were at the pub. But when I looked at the running times of the album and I looked at what they'd actually got recorded, if you'd kept the original length version of Planet Caravan and not edited it, you wouldn't have needed an extra track. Uh, and that's a fact. So, okay, they edited it, but to be honest, the longer length version of Planet Caravan suits me down to the ground. You, that could go on for half half Great an album song. for all I'm concerned. Yeah, absolutely. So the success of Paranoid, what it does for the band commercially, it certainly put them over the top, right? Things change from here on out. There was a thing in Britain at that time, Eric, where you would be what was called a serious albums band, which Black Sabbath certainly would have thought they were. Um, but you could get a, what was called a crossover pop hit where one of your songs would somehow mysteriously appear in the singles chart in Britain. Um, and we had a lot of cases that all of these bands that, that you're talking about all managed that. Um, your Eye Heat managed it, Deep Purple managed it, Hawkwind managed it and so on. And Black Sabbath's big shot at this was with the song Paranoid because it's um, a very catchy tune. And it did see them get on uh, our weekly TV show, Top of the Pops. And it did attract that kind of teeny band um, of supporters, if you like, that we had over here, you know, who would turn up to see um, these these handsome young men performing their their pop hits, which, of course, went down like a lead balloon with uh, the serious Black Sabbath, who would then resort to playing Paranoid at the opening of the show so that they could get to see those people go home, if you like, once they'd realised what they were in for after Paranoid had finished. If you talk to bands like UFO and Uriah Heep, I think they would have said, boy, if only we could have had that type of song. Because a popular song like that introduces the entire catalog to a lot of people. Sure, there are going to be a lot of people who just hear that song and have no interest in anything else from that band. It's just a great song. But 
it introduces, uh, I'll give you an example, just hearing Jump by Van Halen. I mean, not anything like what the early Van Halen was, but it introduced me to them, and I'm a huge yeah. fan to this day. So if UFO, Uriah Heep, bands like that have had that one song, it just it can do a lot for a band. There was a thing at the time in 1970 where Ozzy particularly is, um, they're quite sniffy, as we'd say about it, you know, that it's um, it's compromising your art in a way. You've got your art, your series albums, and now you've got these, these young kids and young girls buying your record and shouting and screaming at you. And that's not what we're here for. That's not what we're about, you know. And But as you correctly say, as, as the decade went on, they're starting to realise it's actually quite useful if you can get one of those songs high in the singles chart. Um, and you see this, I mean, all the bands that you're interested in, you see this happening with, don't you? Kiss had it with Rock and Roll Night. They needed that song. Needed that. Not the studio one, of course, but the live version becomes a hit. Led Zeppelin, Whole lot of Love. I mean, once you, yeah. you get that surge of interest from fans, after a year or two, you shake all that out and you get all the Fairweather fans, they take off. You've still got a lot left there from that group of fans they're gonna stick around actually a lot of bands i will say their biggest hit single is not their best song i, I oh, don't yeah. th- i mean paranoid's a great song but i don't think it's their best song but it just had that certain something at the right time i would agree with you um the thing i found in in uh, all of the sabbath tours that i've seen them on was you'd, you'd wait for the encore and with respect you'd be thinking oh god <laughs> Here it and comes. i used to think why, why don't why don't you come on stage and open with Paranoid? I mean, let's, let's have a good time and get it out of the way. I saw ACDC once, and I think um, You Shook Me All Night Long was about the second song in on the Stiff Upper Lip Tour or something, you know. I thought, great, thank God for that. That's got that out of the way. And I love the song, don't get me wrong. But, um, I mean, many years ago we, were, we saw Europe back in Birmingham, and they'd gone off stage, and somebody in the audience said, do you think they'll come back for an encore? And they hadn't done the final countdown. You kind of thought, well, I, I think they might come back, yeah. You think? <laughs> you know, in, in 2004, when Sammy rejoined Van Halen, they opened with Jump. Never done right. that before. Open with it. Kiss fans, well, I, I listen to so many Kiss podcasts, and they talk about that. Like, what if they just opened with rock and roll all night? Yes. What, what would that, how would that change things? But. Yeah, it's like Alice Cooper. Open with schools out. Don't do it as the uncle. Open with it. Right. Then we can have a great time. We can get on with the show. By the way, Alice came around here recently, and man, that guy, he could still bring it, and he's got the great bands, and he just, yeah. he's better as he gets older because he's even more of that character, the Alice character. I always figured he would grow into that character, yeah. Um And in terms of growing into characters, one uh, we're talking about Sabbath again, but there was a big thing back then in the 70s, um, again, trying to explain to your listeners how it was. There was this thing about growing and developing as a band. You had to be seen to be growing and developing. And that's something that continually is something that bothers Black Sabbath as time goes on. So we've had two albums pretty much on the bounce in Black Sabbath, Paranoid. I think what they come up with next on Master of Reality is astonishing. Um, for me, that's the darkest album. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. Don't miss an episode of the Booked on Rock podcast. Subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts or just go to the Booked on Rock website, bookedonrock.com, to find a full listing of podcast platforms where you can subscribe and follow. That's bookedonrock.com. The Paranoid album puts Sabbath on the map, and they end up playing at the Royal Albert Hall, April of 71. Mm-hmm. They're on top of the world. They head back into the studio to record what would be the Masters of Reality album, released in July of 1971. Number five in the UK, eight in the US. An admittedly short album. The band didn't have much mm-hmm. time after getting off the road to write music, which is very indicative of that era of just tour, mm-hmm. record, tour, record, let's go, let's go, let's go. Eight tracks in all, including the lead track, Sweet Leaf, a last-minute song written for the album. Geezer said it was inspired by cigarettes you could only buy in Ireland. Yeah, Afton, um, sweet leaf cigarettes, and he saw it written on the package. You know, it's uh, it's a sweet leaf that that uh, works best, or whatever, or gets you higher, or something. And he um, he came up with the title of sweet leaf. Now, 
what I particularly like about Master of Reality, um, there's the kind of the preemptive spinal tap cover, which I kind of quite like there. You know, how black is it? But I like the way Aussies are very different on, on Master of Reality. To me, it's a more personal record. Um, I love the first two albums. But on this album, he sounds like he's sat here right here with me and you, Eric, and he's talking directly to us. There's something extremely personal about the way he delivers the lyrics and comes across on this album to me. And then you get that, wow, that, that astonishing difference in the sound of the down tuning of the guitars, the down tuning of the bass. And you've got what I would call, you know, the big songs on the album being um, big ones for me, Sweet Leaf, um, Into the Void, Lord of This World, Children of the Grave. Those are for me the big four. I think um, After Forever, I'd put slightly below that. I, I don't know why, but I would. And then you've got the the two instrumentals, which are terrific and do exactly what they're supposed to and set you up for the, um, the drama that's going to follow them. The album is too short. There's no doubt about that. But it's difficult to see how they could have extended it very easily, except I think they should have used the full length version of Children of the Grave. The outtake has um, a much longer outro on it, which I, I love. And they certainly could have put it on. That's Tony Aomi's cough we hear to open that track, Sweet Leaf, right? It took yeah. took a drag on a reefer. Yeah, yeah. It, it was apparently passed to him as a reefer that was passed to him by Ozzy, I think, while he was recording Orchid. And and again, that's the producer, Roger Baines' brilliance, to take that cough and make it... <coughs> <coughs> now, again, whether Sabbath knew anything about that, I don't know. Um, they seem to have not known very much about what was going on at all with some of the recording. But that album is so um, intense and personal and... Uh, and the poster that came with it of them standing with um, what Ozzy calls Beatles for Sale eyes. If anyone's seen the cover of the album, Beatles for Sale, where they look sort of very stoned and distant. And again, you've got a, a beautiful quiet track as well um, in, in Solitude um, as, as the extra track on there that gets overlooked. Um, just running through the tracks there. And uh, I knew there's one I wanted to mention, especially Solitude is a beautiful, beautiful slow ballad with those um, tinkling bells and so on. A song about depression. It's a very, very affecting track indeed. One of the best tracks on the album, but again, was never going to get played live because they were never going to play these um, sports arenas and places and go, um, here's, here's solitude for you. It's not going to happen. And they go out on tour. They gig with Yes at one point. You talked to Rick Wakeman. Ozzy yeah. became real good friends with Rick. When you try and write these books, you, 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 I mean, just to be clear, I approach everybody. Uh, the first thing I do is I make a list of everybody who's played on the albums, all the engineers, all the producers, and I approach every single one of them if it's possible. And what happens is some of them come back instantly because they're just so delighted that somebody wants to talk to them. And some people, you just keep bouncing emails to them and bouncing. You, and I write, put a note of when I last wrote to them and I send it again, send it again. And some of them will eventually come and play. And some people won't. Um, the, the, the likes of um, Iomi, Ward, Osborne, but, you know, they don't need to talk to me and they, they probably won't because it means they're sanctioning my opinions in the book. I think that's how it goes. But the one that did surprise me was Rick Whiteman. I was really, really staggered that he came back to me and agreed to, to give his thoughts and opinions, um, which is very kind of him to do so. It really was. He hung out with Ozzy a lot during that tour. Yeah, I mean, you, you've got this kind of vegetarian kind of health food ethic band in, yes, who have got Rick Wakeman as their keyboards player, who um, I think by his own admission, Rick was a man who, you know, liked to drink and didn't necessarily go over always for the healthy food. There's a famous story about the curry he ordered during the Tales of Topographic Oceans tour. You probably know that story, where he was a bit bored on stage and Rody delivered a curry to him, which he proceeded to eat. So a lively chap, Rick, and when he was touring with Yes and Black Sabbath, he found um, it quite entertaining to travel with Black Sabbath rather than Yes. An interesting bill, but I think you mentioned it in the book that it went off well. The audiences dug the two bands yeah. playing together. They're different. One's progressive and one is a little heavier, but it worked. I've noticed that looking into the past uh, in America, you seem to get these really intriguing bills. I mean, one night they played with Alice Cooper as well. Um, Black Sabbath, yes, and Alice Cooper. You look at these bills and you think, God, I wish I'd been there, man. You know, that would have been terrific. And um, over in Britain, we were much more conservative. Um, the likes of Black Sabbath would never tour with anybody who was remotely going to upstage them. It would be an up and coming band. 
and that would be it. Uh, it's only in recent years, really, the comparative that we've actually had support bands who were, you know, as good as the, the headliners, if you like. Um, in fact, the first real shock like that actually came with Black Sabbath when somebody decided to put Van Halen on with um, Black Sabbath. And I think it's because they were on the same label. But Black Sabbath by then are, if you like, uh, flabby, struggling, um, trying to come up for air, if you like. And and they've got this lean, hungry band as a support. And, you know, that was just a no, no, no. They were running the, on fumes like, by that point. Yeah, that's late 70s, 78. In 71 or 72, the band, by this point, it's, they're going through that grueling tour record, tour cycle. So many bands did that when they became a moneymaker for the labels. The seemingly endless use of cocaine is also becoming a big part of the band's everyday life. So much so they wanted to call the yeah. next album Snowblind, but the record company said no to that as well. Black Sabbath, Volume 4, released in September of 72. Number 5, UK. Number 13, US. Roger Bain not asked back to produce, and instead of recording the album in the UK, they recorded it in LA. They rented a house in Bel Air. It was a philanthropist named John DuPont. It was his house, and they yeah. go there to rehearse. Ozzy said the band was on an epic bender of substance abuse at the mansion. You say the song Snowblind is the greatest ever Sabbath track. That is saying a lot. Why do you feel that way? I did say that, didn't I? I mean, um, first of all, I want to say um, the first thing I decided in doing a book on Black Sabbath in the 70s, I wanted to avoid the kind of recreational drugs as much as I could. Because if you're buying the book, um, you're going to be a fan, probably, and you're going to know all of that. And I wanted to just try and focus on the music as much as I could. Um, it wasn't something I wanted to to talk about, apart from when I felt I had to. And you cannot talk about the Volume 4 album and not mention the copious drugs used, because it's there, credited on the, um, the sleeve itself, thanks to the great Coke, you know, Cola Company, you know. Of LA, but Snowblind, um, you know, when you see a band, there's always a song that kind of does it for you or works for you or, or whatever it is. And one for me, Snowblind, I think it's just that intro riff from Tony just gets me straight away. Um, Ozzy's vocal melody is absolutely terrific. Um, the number of different riffs that Tony Iommi gets into the song. The different sections of the song are terrific. Um, he even gets in one of his best solos for me uh, that he's ever played in that song. And then to top it off right at the end, you get a bit of Mellotron coming in and that kind of like string effects and everything. And it's just, I've had so many great times, Eric, at the front, crushed up, jumping up and down to Snowblind. And um, it, it's, it just is it for me. I, I can't say any more than that. There's another standout song from the Volume 4 album. That's Changes. Tony mm -hmm. Iommi had just started to play the piano around this time, and out comes this beautifully dark piece. Rick Wakeman was actually there at the time. The song was being recorded. They could have asked him to play in it, but to their credit, they don't, and that makes a difference. I think it does. Um, because Tony Iommi is, at this stage, certainly not um, a skilled piano player, he plays it almost naively and simply, and it has a kind of a raw um, feel to it that suits the plaintiff lyrics. If Rick Wakeman had played it, he would have played it superbly well. And I'm not so sure it would have had quite the same effect. Um, Rick will say it would have been just as good. Of course he will. But a similar case in point comes with Judas Priest, where Glenn Tipton plays um, piano on some of their earlier records and plays it similarly naively and playing it. I think it sounds great. And then by the time they get to like the Nostradamus album, they've got Don Airy on keyboards and it's it's all perfectly done, but it doesn't work quite as well for me. Too clean and pristine, maybe, if they had done that. See, changes should be should be terrible. It should be absolutely terrible. But um, and there are people I know who don't like it. But I, I think it's a good song. I think it works well. And the the wobbly Mellotron on it, um, courtesy of Geese, is very nice indeed. Oh, it makes it sound There's eerie. Only one it, it, well, I think the Mellotron yeah. gives it the Sabbath eerie vibe to it. Geezer decided yes, to use this does. instead of a string section, right? Yeah, I, 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 yeah absolutely. They, again, they could have gone for a string section, and they certainly used a string section in a couple of places on the album. But in this case, I think it was the correct decision to use the Mellotron. The, the only Duff track, really bad one, is that awful FX thing that they inflict on us um, before Supernaut. I mean, that that's just, that's part of your life. You'll never get back again listening to that. <laughs> yes. It's terrible. 
Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, the band's fifth studio album released December 1st, 1973. Title is supposed to have been Bill Ward's idea, and it's a reworking of a Melody Maker headline title, which read Bloody Hell, Black Sabbath. A visit from members of Led Zeppelin to the studios leads to a supergroup jam mm-hmm. session affectionately recalled as Black Zeppelin. No indication at all yeah, that these recordings exist? No, um, and the reason we certainly don't exist is because Mike Butcher, him again, um, was the engineer on it, and he says um, certainly he wasn't pressing any record buttons, and he was there. A lot of people pick Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath as their favourite album, and I can certainly see why, and it's one that comes into my mind as a favourite. Um, National Acrobat is, is a song that I'm enormously fond of, which is Geezer's only main riff contribution to the Sabbath catalogue in this era. He wrote the riff. It's a great song. Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, great song. Um, I struggle with fluff a bit on a good day. I can get through it and enjoy its kind of Fleetwood Mac albatrossy vibe and um, so on. And then some days I would be a bit bored of it. I mean, back in the day, again, uh, to any kids listening out there, when we had the LPs, um, you had to to pretty much sit through it whether you liked it or not because you you couldn't be bothered to go and pick the needle up and move it on, really. But um, So, yeah... Um, and I think it, I think it loses its way a little bit on side two, perhaps. But on the whole, yeah, it's a really good, solid album. With Sabbath still at their peak, and you also get the advantage of Ozzy Osbourne um, inventing one-fingered synthesizer music some years before it actually came into fashion. What's the story behind the title track? Wasn't it inspired by the inv- spooky environment the band was recording in Clearwell Castle in the forest of Clearwell Dean Castle. Gloucestershire, um, England? Didn't Tony once say he saw a black figure roaming around the castle? Of course he did. Um, Eric, if you come over to England, and I hope you do, and you go to any old place, it'll be haunted. I guarantee you it'll be haunted. Yeah? Yeah, they'll tell you that. They always tell you that. Um, They saw a figure ahead of them walking down a corridor, and it turned into a room, and they chased after the figure. And when they got there, surprise, surprise, it wasn't there. It wasn't a drunk Ozzy running around? Well... I would, I would, I would put money on it being a drunk member of the band or the entourage. Yeah, and they did play tricks on each other then. But it got, it got the story. And of course, as you know, um, there was a bit of a problem at the time. They had a bit of, um, bit of problems coming up with material. And Tony Iommi was listening to the new Golden Earring album, the quite fabulous Moon Tan, probably their best record. And as usual, the others had gone off to the pub while Omi, Tony got sorted because. Tony's riffs would tend to be 99% of the time to start behind every Sabbath song. You know, we've got the riff, now we get going on the song. So while they went off to the pub, Tony sat there coming up with um, what is one of his greatest riffs. It's got to be said, you put that on, it just blasts out the speakers, grabs you by the throat. What an absolutely awesome riff that is. Ozzy is terrific on it. He's just absolutely amazing. Um, it gives it real passion and feeling, and then you get some fuzz bass from Geezer and Bill's percussion. What's not to like? Do you remember the story of Ozzy in, on the 78 tour where he, he was so out of it, stone drunk or whatever else he was on, that he goes back to what he thinks is his hotel room, and it's somebody else's hotel room, entirely different hotel? That's from the 78 tour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he crashes on the bed. And he thinks yeah. he's in his room. Oh, man, Ozzy. And he is still hes still with us, man. God love him. He is. I don't uh, know how. <laughs> oh, man. I, I didn't put the stories in the book, um, for, just for the listener's benefit. Um, most of those Ozzy stories are not in because they, they, we all cherish them and we all know them. And if, if you buy the book and you want them, they're all over the net. So I did manage to get one or two Ozzy stories that are not well known in the book because the person who has never told them before. So so that was useful, really, for me. But, um, yeah, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath also sees Ozzy's voice going right up. He sings a lot higher Yeah, on a lot of the songs. His voice is just perfect for Black Sabbath. It really, yeah. you know, and, and for the songs that he would end up singing on throughout his solo career to this day. He's just got a unique voice. Yeah, this, um, yeah his voice is absolutely terrific on it. Um, Who Are You, the track he brings in, um, Ozzy's, um, I've written a song, boys. You can imagine their faces because it's probably, I think, to be fair, the worst track on the album, Who Are You. You'll be getting outraged listeners now. 
but it's interesting that I think that Geezer and Tony managed to salvage the middle section of Who Are You with a nice instrumental break um, that works a treat. So there we go. But yeah, a, a big album for them. It really, really was Sabbath, bloody Sabbath. Sabotage, July 28, 1975. That's the release date. My personal pick is Am I Going Insane Radio. This is a misleading title. What's the title about? <laughs> Yeah, it's quite funny because over the years, it, there's been all these things about where the title has come from. Um, it's It must be a radio editor uh, because of the single, and it isn't. It comes from slang in Birmingham, um, where I grew up as well. And anybody who's thought to be, and we're going to go a bit politically incorrect here, Eric, if that's okay. Uh-oh. Go ahead. We were thought to have mental health issues um, and were thought to be, as was said at that time, we're not condoning it now. It was said to be mental. They were said to be going radio rental, which was a chain of shops that sold TVs and electrical equipment in the Midlands, Birmingham area. And we're called radio rentals. So if Eric's having problems, he's gone a bit radio rental. I had never heard that before until reading your book. I've gone, I've gone radio Sorry. rental a few times. Trust me. Exactly. So am I going insane? <laughs> radio the clattering drums of Bill Ward are terrific on that. Um, and Mike Butch is very proud of the fact that you can hear him on the album. That's him shouting attack at the beginning of the opening track, um, Hole in the Sky. And you kind of, I don't know if, if you're the same as me um, and the listeners, but you know, you sometimes just get pictures in your mind when you listen to a song. You kind of, I can always imagine the band on stage doing it for some reason. I see them playing the song in my head, but also you get other pictures and that hole in the sky is just like, like some kind of Viking ship or something coming towards me on sort of the waves. It just keeps coming like waves of power at you. And then after hole in the sky, you've got probably arguably one of Tony's greatest riffs. Um, you get that fabulous don't start too late, which is Mike Butcher's what he used to say to them. Um, and then that's been misconstrued over the years as to why it's called don't start too late. Um, but Mike told me personally, it's because they were a difficult band to record with. He said they were well rehearsed Black Sabbath in the studio. They knew what they were doing, but they liked to mess about. They liked to have a laugh. And, and, time is money. So sometimes you'd have to say to him, you'd have to get schoolmaster on him and go, right, come on, work now, we're working now. And they would. But that whole thing about don't start was him saying, look, don't start, Eric, don't start, i.e. don't start messing about. You know what's interesting, and, Chris, uh, reading your book and then looking at all of these albums, they had quite a few instrumentals, sometimes two on an album. It's Tony Iommi. It's about the dynamics and the contrast of um, setting um, something quite like Don't Start Too Late, which is a bit like um, Flight of the Bumblebee or something, this kind of little acoustic-y kind of picking piece that's fast, like something escaping an oncoming storm. And then that riff, when it comes in, sounds even more brutal than it would have done. Um, it's like something coming in and destroying your crops or something or whatever it would be. It's just... That riff on, on Symptom of the Universe is just something else. They also go a bit prog rock on Sabotage with Megalomania, which is probably the most one of the most out there things that Black Sabbath ever did. I would think Megalomania. It's got um, everything but the kitchen sink on it, really. It's um, heading off into Yes territory, I think, at times. I was going to say, maybe as a result of their time touring with Yes. I think there's probably some truth in that, yeah. I, it's a great, solid album. Some people don't like Superzar, the big instrumental on side two. I don't think Ozzy was too keen on it, but yeah, it's they certainly got themselves a good intro tape out of it, that's for sure. Sabotage is the one, the people that ask me my favourite album, I'd, I'd usually say Master Reality, but some days I might say Sabotage. One last note on Sabotage, the album cover. You get the guys standing in front of a mirror. What was the story behind this? <laughs> you know um, Rene Magritte's work? Yeah. The, group, the artist. The idea was, I think it was one of their, um, their inner circle, whose name I've gone blank on, but one of the inner circle had the idea of doing a Magritte kind of image where um, the reflection in the mirror is like the back view and not the front view and so on and so forth. And it was going to be like a doomy castle sort of environment to the big, big ornamental mirror that they were looking into with, you know, the mist around it and what have you. Great. That sounds absolutely great. So they turned up for what they thought were trial shots for the album cover. And why they're dressed in some of that garb is utterly beyond me. And the trial shots turned out to be the album cover. Yeah, Ozzy's wearing some almost kiss-like boots there. 
Yeah, yeah, he's um, he's it, it's Bill Ward, isn't it? Let's cut to the chase. Bill Ward's look is strange for a band of their their peak, their size, their stature in 1975 to come up to even have an album cover that wasn't one they were expecting. And where they're dressed, the way they are, look the way they are. It, yeah, it does show a band that hasn't got as much control as it should. But, you know, I love that cover, Eric. In, in as much as, it's hard to put this into words, but where it's sort of like Led Zeppelin almost seemed like um, rock gods and Pink Floyd were like rock gods and stuff, Black Sabbath seemed almost like almost like mates to us who'd made it big in a band. They seem, They always seem more down to earth than many bands did. And I'm not counting the likes of Robert Plant and John Bonham in that, but, you know, um, they all seem like people you could have a chat with or you might meet in the pub somehow. We were very proud of them in Birmingham. They, they were like our band, if you like, our contribution to rock. And so we were enormously proud of them. The band's final two albums of the 70s, 1976's Technical Ecstasy, in 1978's mm. Never Say Die. What are your thoughts on those last mm. two albums? No standout tracks commercially, but are there moments worth revisiting from those two? The, the problem is, is having gone through all of those albums and been on that journey with Black Sabbath, we're kind of following that journey and we're up to sabotage and everything's rosy. And we, obviously we didn't know what was really going on um, with them at the time and when technical ecstasy came out you thought oh they've got they've got like a proper cover this time around hypnosis had done the cover he'd done lots of bands that looks two robots on an escalator okay but you know and you put the album on and it sounds more polished and produced than we've heard from black sabbath before with tony really producing it the box set came out last year the super deluxe set um of the album and i prefer all of the demo recordings on that album to the ones that are actually released um all moving parts stand still for example i think is if you've not heard it i urge you to listen to it is way way better on the outtake version than it is on the album so i i just think it's a bit overproduced and clean and a bit sterile and there are moments when you hear sabbath come through Dirty Women, there's, where there's a bit where Iommi hits this real kind of grungy riff and you think, oh, that's Black Sabbath again. I can hear them coming through on that. And um, You Won't Change Me, The um, it's got some nice traditional Sabbath bits, but there's there's other parts of the album that for me just don't work. It's All Right is a good song. Well done, Bill, for singing it, but should it be on the album? Oh, I don't really think so, no. And She's Gone, Ozzy with the orchestra. I, th- I think it's terrible. But the outtake version where it's Black Sabbath playing it simply, as we talked about earlier with changes, the outtake version is fine, is much better. And if anyone out there has not heard the outtakes that came with the Super Deluxe Edition um, and you're not keen on technical ecstasy, do go and have a listen because it will change your mind. What about the follow-up then, the last of the 70s, Never Say Die? Yeah. yeah. um, Another hypnosis cover. I don't like the cover. And I find it interesting because... The whole thing of never say die, um, going back to that era, I think they should have gone with something like a World War II pilots and uh, bombing raid crew resting between missions rather than this kind of sci fi ish look, which doesn't do that much for me. Um, the actual title track, Never Say Die itself, came out before the album, and we thought, yeah, okay, this is, this is Sabbathy, this is um, a bit tinny maybe, and the riff is recycled from Thin Lizzy's The Boys Are Back in Town. Very definitely. Um, but, yeah, we can go with that. But the, the production is woeful, i never say die. It's it's too thin. Um, Iommi's guitar is lost at times. Bill Ward sounds like he's playing about two blocks away. Ozzy's not, not on half of side two, when you look at it, really. He's not on the, the instrumental track. And uh, and Bill Ward sings another track, um, Swinging the Chain. Ozzy's not on that. So and there are moments, like on... Um, Junior's eyes sounds a bit Sabbathy when they were good at times. Um, Johnny Blade's got moments, but some of the tracks I just don't think are up to it at all. This is the point where it's pretty much they run out of gas. At one point, Geezer was fired. Then they get him back. Then Ozzy quits. And this is something I don't even know if I've ever read this before. At one point, they brought in Savoy Brown singer Dave Walker in 1977, and he started writing lyrics for the Never Say Die album. 
even appeared with a band on TV in 1978. That's on YouTube. Yeah, it's um, you can hear it, but you can't see it. Um, what happened was Ozzy had the band are under terrific pressure. I mean, for anyone who doesn't get this, they, they've got a contract, they've got to produce records, and that's what counts. Doing the gigs and the records is what counts. Everything else is secondary. You either you turn up and do your job or you're doing your job or you can't. Um, um, Steve Pilkington would have told you about the damage it did to your right heap where they, you know, they had um, people dying in the band and becoming seriously ill. And if you couldn't make those commitments, it was a problem. So Ozzy was sacked and they got Dave Walker in because somebody knew him. The band had known him from. And it shows how up against it they were, Eric, because there were no rehearsals. There was no kind of ACDC kind of Bon Scott replacement come along to the rehearsal. They just got an old mate in who they knew could handle the job. And Dave Walker comes over having written all these lyrics. I'm sat at home in Birmingham and the local paper tells us that this local magazine TV show is going to have Black Sabbath on with Dave Walker. Well, what's this about, you know? So I saw it. I can picture it in my mind's eye. Um, but nobody seems to have copied it because you couldn't back then. Nobody could really copy any film. So the film does exist, but I recorded it by putting um, a microphone in front of the TV. So some of the versions of it which are out there on YouTube are actually from my recording, without a doubt, because what you did back in those days was you were in touch with other fans and say, anyone got a copy of this? And you would just give it to them. because That's what you did. So a few of us recorded it, probably. How does it sound? They would have been in a terrible state, quite frankly. Um, Dave Walker is a kind of a bluesy singer. If you imagine something like uh, Coverdale doing a kind of Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City kind of vibe and a bit of R&B. Yeah, that's just interesting. And then Ozzy does come back for the well, next album and tour. You can see the desperation. You've got the record company down coming down on you. When's, when's the album going to be ready? What are you doing? You've just lost, you've just lost that, that singer. Uh, what are you going to do now? And so they just got in somebody fast and it didn't work. But um, again, in the book, Dave Walker talks about going to the pub with the band and um, and Ozzy turning up to sit and have a drink with them. And Walker knew then that there was uh, the writing was on the wall because obviously if you've just sacked your singer and he's turning up in the pub for a drink with you, then clearly there's some regret going on and recriminations. And Ozzy would have wanted to come back and certainly Bill would have wanted him to come back because those two seem to have been the closest together in the band in that way at this point none of the guys in the band have argued that they were ready to call it quits by this point because with the tour with van halen in 78 this is when they know it's mm. van halen blew the band off stage even tony iomi said they made sabbath look quote a bit drab and ozzy later shared tony's opinion it was tony who had the job of firing ozzy and we know what became of ozzy his career revived with those two classic solo albums and sabbath moves on with ronnie james dio before I let you go, Chris, you got to tell the story about it. Tony Iommi gave you a ride home once. This is an awesome story. Can you tell us? What it was, was I'd been to see, um, I went to see Glenn Hughes and he was singing in a place called Dudley outside Birmingham. And I don't drive. So it was a bit of an effort to get there. And the support band was a band called Luna Mile. And the singer yeah. of Luna Mile was Tony Marie Iommi, um, Tony's daughter. And she, um, she's her mom. I think is um, Oriental, Asiatic, and she'd got her dad's looks and this kind of Oriental looks. And she was the kind of person you'd notice instantly. And Glenn Hughes would let anyone watch his sound check at that time, and whatever you could just go in if he recognised you and he knew you, that was cool. As long as you behaved yourself, that was cool. So I went in and watched Glenn's sound check and Luna Mile was sat there and she was sat at a separate table doing something or other and nobody would go near her because she's kind of got this, um, I think because she was just so, looked so great. So I went up and spoke to her and said, um, I enjoyed your sound check. It's, it's a terrific band. You've got an amazing voice. And she said, oh, sit down. So we had a chat and we were chatting. Lovely woman. And she asked where I was from. And I said, I lived in uh, Shirley in Solihull at that time. And she said, oh, I live in um, Stratford-on-Avon, Warwickshire, which is not far past where you live. And I said, oh, I'll be a late, like one getting home tonight. And she said, oh, how are you getting back? And I said, I'll probably get a train and then a late night bus. And she said, um, um, we'll give you a lift. And I thought she meant her in the band. And I said, no. And she said, oh, yeah, dad's coming to watch. <laughs> 
because he's a mate of Glenn Hughes, as you know, because he did the Seven Star album with him. Yep. So he said, Dad's coming to watch the stuff, and Dad will, Dad will drop you back on the way to mine, because he lived out Lapworth Way, which is past Stratford and Oman. And, and I just think, hey, your dad, your dad, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> And he came and he signed autographs for fans and so on in that humble way that he's got. And then we went to his car afterwards and he put my details into his sat nav. And I sat in the front passenger seat. She sat in the back. And I thought, I've got to be cool about this. So we didn't talk about Black Sabbath all the way back. And that was immensely hard. I thought that was a cool thing to do. Right. And really, really hard to talk about anything but Black Sabbath. I thought, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be a fanboy in the car. So we talked about Birmingham and growing up in Birmingham. And and I literally, I was running, I just wanted to turn around and say, great riff, Tony. <laughs> I thought, I can't do that. What year was this? It was 2004, five-ish. That is cool. Yeah. What a story. Very cool, man. What a story. True. <laughs> yeah you're so right though don't talk about the band don't don't sound like because then he's gonna be like okay i'm sitting with a uh insane fan here who's gone radio uh <laughs> what's the term he's gone radio rental. edit radio rental no, it, i have somebody here radio, with radio it, rental. <laughs> somebody it just seemed like well I don't, I don't know suppose suppose sammy hager gave you a lift yeah you feel like we're in a different we're doing a different situation here we're in like something that's different that's how I felt. Yeah, that's that's so cool, man. What a story. Black Sabbath in the 1970s. It is out now through Sonic Bond Publishing, through Amazon in the U.S., through Burning Shed in the U.K. I'll put the links up on the show notes page and social media pages, Chris. Um, I have got an Instagram page. I've, I've joined the 21st century, I think it is, and I do have an Instagram account. Um, if anyone wants to follow me, I'd be grateful. It's uh, Chris Sutton, all one word, 1961. That's me. By the way, a happy birthday to Stephen Lamb, the man behind yes. Sonic Bond Publishing. Yeah, as we record this, this Stephen is on. We both love you very much. Yes, we do. Yes, this is Stephen's birthday on the day we're recording this. Chris Sutton, thanks so much for being on the podcast again. Looking forward to having you back. Thanks, Eric. Take care and speak to you soon. I also want to wish a belated happy birthday to my dad who turned 83 right around the time this is being recorded. The best dad ever. Inspired me to be a broadcaster, taught me everything I know about it, and has had seemingly insurmountable hurdles health-wise that he's overcome time and time again. It is a blessing to still have him in my life. Go to YouTube and type in Jim Senich to check out some audio of his days as a DJ and sportscaster. He's interviewed baseball legends Ted Williams, Phil Rizzuto, I also put up audio of him as a DJ back in 1962. You got to hear it. It is a trip. Also put a link up in the show notes page if you're interested. Happy birthday, Dad. I love you. Thanks for listening. As always, I'm Eric Senich. Join me again next time for another episode of Booked on Rock. Mm-hmm.